Hello, this is the Stories Beside channel. I release videos every day for you. Subscribe and click the bell. Maria, the ER doctor, was sitting in the break room with the nurse, a single and Kevin the chauffeur, drinking hot coffee from a thermos. The shift was coming to an end with only two hours left. But no sooner had the colleagues purchased a fragrant beverage than the dispatcher's voice rang out, Brigade Number 6 on the move. The address is 1 Waterst, Brooklyn, NY. The River Cafe Restaurant. There's a wedding. One of the guests suddenly became ill. The description sounds like allergies, Maria thought. Here we go again. I hate those outings. Everybody drinks too much. And then there's a stabbing or a fight or something worse. But there's nothing to do. A job's a job. So the crew rushed to the scene. The restaurant was clearly booked by wealthy people. There was a doorman at the entrance. There were insanely expensive cars in the parking lot. When he saw the ambulance crew, he let them in without a question, warned them that he was marrying his daughter without a street. Our famous millionaire. You be careful there, because his temper is too tough, and I'm afraid of him myself. The chauffeur just waved his hand. You know, we're used to it. It's not a job. It's a real adventure. You don't get bored. It was stuffy in the hall. Fancy music was playing, and the guests were drinking and enjoying themselves. The Toastmaster kept announcing contests, and only in the far corner on three folded chairs was some drunken citizen lying there. A few people and a frightened waiter were bustling around him. The poor guy was breathing with a whistling sound, his eyes bulging. His tongue was hanging out of his mouth. He wasn't red, he was blue. Maria realized everything at once. It was a practical shock. Apparently, she was having an allergic reaction to some kind of alcohol or snack. She shouted in a business-like manner, open the window and let me approach the patient. She took off his choking tie and unbuttoned his shirt sleeves. Nurse Cindy helped draw the medicine into a syringe and they administered several intravenous shots to the patient. Then she carried to the victim's nose on a prong. He immediately began to regain consciousness. After about 10 minutes, he was feeling much better. The swelling of his throat was gone and he was breathing normally. The man thanked the medics. Phew, that was a relief. I thought I was going to die. Thank you, gentlemen. What was that all about? Why did I get so sick? I got all twisted up. It had never happened before. Maria was strictly reading the patient. Are you allergic to alcohol? Most likely. So try not to drink anything alcoholic for the rest of the evening. Otherwise, next time it could be over. You don't joke about that. The millionaire Robert began to thank the ambulance crew and tried to slip them a wad of large bills in front of everyone, showing his importance and generosity. Maria immediately objected, don't need it. Take it away. We're just doing our job. Suddenly, she glanced at the groom out of the corner of her eye and felt sick to her stomach. Could it be Frank? It couldn't be the same face and hair and hairstyle. My God, it's been so many years. The bastard looks good. Turns out he's marrying a millionaire's daughter. She walked up to the guy, said hello. Hi, Frank. Congratulations, a profitable marriage. He looked at her surprised and somehow completely aloof. Do you recognize it? I'm not Frank. I'm James, we haven't met. But thank you anyway. It's a pleasure. Maria was taken aback and thought to herself, what a bastard. It's nice for him. That's such a lie. We had such an affair, such love, and now he makes a fool of me. It's out of line. She got angry and went back to her fiance. What kind of kindergarten? Frank, how did I come up? You know me so well. I don't know why you should lie, or are you so intimidated that you're afraid to admit it? The millionaire came running up and decided to intervene. What's going on? The man told you clearly, I think, that he doesn't know you. You did your job. You did your job. So what's the good news? Do you know where the exit is? The guests started to turn on them. But Maria was unstoppable. Such was her character that she hated lies and was determined to prove by all means that she was not lying. 
The woman almost screamed with indignation. How could that be? I know Frank very well. We had a relationship. He also has a prominent mole on his neck. Right here, just below the collar of his shirt. And she tried to pull the collar back. The millionaire went ballistic. Get that crazy woman out of here before she spoils my daughter's wedding. Security, get over here. Throw her out. Nobody messes with this place. There was a commotion. The groom denied it and swore he'd never seen the woman before. Cindy was frightened at all, held to the wall and only beaten for life. Chauffeur Kevin quickly oriented himself, jumped up, pulled Maria sharply by the sleeve. I'm sorry, I identified the woman. My mistake, it's time. Have a good day, don't be ill. They dashed out of the restaurant and quickly got into the ambulance. A stunned Kevin began to talk to the doctor. Maria, what was that about you, anyway? It was as if the devil had got into you. What are you doing with the groom? God forbid, he will complain. That rich man is a pain in the ass for all of us. The woman exhaled a little came to her senses and suddenly burst into tears. Yes, because he lies everything. We had such a love when we were young, we even wanted to get married. And now he not only pretended he didn't know, but he made a fool of me. You see, he's not Frank. He didn't have a mole though, and I remember he did. It's a hell of a thing. I don't get it. You're right though. I had no right to behave like that and set you all up, I'm sorry. Cindy shook her hands. Oh dear, gee, I don't know. So maybe it really isn't like him. He couldn't have given a false name in front of all the guests. Why would he do that? We need to figure this out. My shift was over, and Maria staggered home, entering the apartment. The cat missed her very much and started petting her. The woman took him in her arms, stroked him, scratched his ear and poured food into a spot, then said sadly out loud, but this is a good my affectionate. Alone you love and wait for me. No one else wants me. She pulled out old pictures from the closet and started going through them. Here she and Frank are out in the countryside barbecuing with friends. How long ago was that? Amazingly the same face as the guy she'd mistaken for her ex fiance today. Well, there is no such as similar people. Just like a copy of Maria lay down on the couch, covered with a blanket, and wanted to take a nap after a sleepless and bright 24 hours at work, she was just tired to death. But it was not like that. He still wouldn't come. Today's incident parsed the woman's soul, and she kept going through the memory of his youth, sighing about what will never come back. Maria grew up in a medical family. Her father was a general practitioner, her mother a dentist in a clinic. They lived in prosperity, did not deny anything. The only daughter since childhood guests often gathered in their hospitable house, treated tea, and celebrated all the holidays together. Of course, almost all of them were also connected with medicine in one way or another. Therefore, Maria could not imagine any other profession. After school, she got into medical school at once at the first attempt. It was not for nothing that her parents coached her in all subjects for a whole year, and she graduated well. She never lived in a dormitory. Why should she, when she had her own apartment? That's why she didn't know what real student life was like. All the time her parents terrified her and told her that the boys would have to wait. The main thing to get a good education and make a career, and the rest will come with itself. After all, youth comes only once, and the girl desperately wanted to love and be loved. Externally, she was good-looking, with a pretty face and new hair, except she was a little chubby. She was always very embarrassed and terribly complex. She tried to sit on a diet. Yes, there was no coup of suitors. Everyone chose slim, long-legged women. Nina, the midwife from the maternity hospital, sometimes came to visit my parents for advice, or just to talk. She lived with her son Frank, the same age as Maria. And one day she came with him. That's how the young people met, in contrast to the quiet domestic Maria. Frank was the first brawler in the yard, and his friends were always hanging around him. 
They would sit up late in the evenings in the gazebo near the house, listening to music and playing the guitar. I guess opposites attract. It was a law of nature. That's why they liked each other. The guy wasn't embarrassed by the girl's fullness. He called her sweetie because she did not spoil her at all. At first, there was friendship. Maria pulled Frank up on various subjects in his vocational school, and he introduced her to street life. They started showing up together. He introduced her to his friends. Guitar songs about love and parting starry night, flowers from the neighbor's flower bed. And Maria, without noticing it, fell in love completely and irrevocably. Frank was just a superhero to her, so brave, romantic, and very daring. He could easily defend his opinion and argue with anyone. It was his short temper and explosive nature and subsequently led to a breakdown in their relationship. Maria's parents were very unhappy about this falling out. Her mother lectured her day and night. Her daughter, well, she found something in this rascal. Outwardly frank, of course, the guy is attractive. What can I say? But the rest live with his mother poor, barely making it. There's Nina who always comes over to borrow money until she gets paid, and the son instead of finding a normal job to help his mother. All he knows is to ride his motorcycle all day long, and he's not serious about playing guitar, and he's dragging you along with him. I don't like all that. But what is your future with him? You'd better take a closer look at your colleagues. The trainees there will be more serious guys. But Maria was just joking. Come on, mom. Frank and I love each other. He's so great. I don't need anyone else. And stop lecturing me about morality. I'm of age, by the way. One day Frank invited Maria for a weekend out of town with his company to the river with tents for barbecue. The girl was very excited. Tried on a bunch of bathing suits and outfits. She was all worried that they remembered her. Twirled and spun in front of the mirror. And somehow managed to wait for the weekend. The picnic was a success. Everybody was having fun, swimming, sunbathing, cooking porridge and roasting meat. And in the evening we sat up to midnight, singing songs by the fire with a guitar and a glass of wine. Frank held Maria close to him, then gave her his sweater to keep her warm. And then suddenly she whispered, come with me, my sweetie. I'll show you something. You've never seen anything so beautiful. It's a surprise. Frank led the girl deep into the forest. She was afraid, but at the same time very interested in the noise of the huge pine tree's wind and suddenly began to cover the small rain. They came out into a clearing. A hut of twigs was situated there. The boy waved enigmatically at her. It was warm and dry inside, and on the ground lay a warm blanket. It smelled of pine needles and some kind of herbs. Frank suddenly began passionately kissing Maria and whispering, I had prepared it especially for us, to get away from everyone. It's really nice. We're like on a desert island, just nature and starry skies. Come here, sweetheart. This is where their first intimacy occurred. Then they watched for a long time, counting the stars through the branches, the tent, and cuddling. There seemed to be no happier people on earth the relationship between the young men developed violently. They fought and made up. The reason for all this was the boy's very hot temper. He could hurt a lot, say mean things in the heat of the moment. And Maria took everything too personally and couldn't get over her resentment for a long time. They also broke up out of stupidity. Maria had been invited to a reunion. Frank was terribly jealous and wouldn't let his fiance go. She could barely get away and not for long. Fun was in full swing. Toasts, dancing, contests. Frank couldn't stand it and decided to go get Maria earlier than they had agreed. He walked into the cafe just as Maria was performing the lambada rocking with a classmate. He was holding her waist and she was twirling her hips. But it was just a contest, nothing more. Frank freaked out, got it all wrong, made an ugly scene said a lot of nasty things to the bride. Maria was mortally offended because she was humiliated in front of everyone for absolutely nothing, just for an innocent dance, and so ended their romance. Both stubbornly did not want to admit their guilt 
and make peace. Then Frank had an affair with a new girl to spite Maria and deliberately hurt her. How she cried and suffered. And she only calmed down when her ex-fiancé went to live with her mother in another city. How many years had passed, and Maria still couldn't forget her Frank. He sat deep in her heart. You don't forget your first love. Maria got a job as a doctor at an emergency station. She lived in her apartment, which her parents helped her buy. She even managed to be married. Her mother, seeing how her daughter was suffering, wanted very much to arrange her fate, persuaded her to meet her young colleague dentist Stephen. The man was sedate and proper, and seemed calm and standing confident in the future. Maria was reluctant for a long time, and then reluctantly agreed. Still, there was no one on the horizon between them, no passion, not even 1% of the emotion she once felt for Frank. It was as calm as the calm on the sea. Soon, they were married by inertia, but married life didn't work out from the beginning. What seemed to her to be calm gradually was actually nerdiness and indifference. Stephen loved himself. He looked at himself in the mirror a hundred times, dressed himself with the latest clothes, was a terrible pedant and a mama's boy. My mother-in-law regularly poured oil on the fire and prodded me, saying, what is it that your leg can't get pregnant? But time was ticking away and family life was like a long drawn out rut with no end in sight. They barely even spoke to each other. Their schedules were different and there was nothing to talk about. All Stephen was interested in was what was for dinner tonight, where the boots cleaned, whether his shirts were pressed. He never cared about his soul or his feelings at all. One day, when he took another jab at his wife about her infertility, she couldn't stand it. Look, Stephen, what do you need kids for anyway? You don't love me at all, only yourself. He wasn't embarrassed at all. He raised an eyebrow and answered, My mom says you have to have a kid to have a normal family. I trust her. That's how everybody lives if you can't have a baby. Then tell me why I'm wasting my time with you. It's not rational. Maria suddenly laughed hysterically. Don't waste your time with me. Let's get a divorce. You're absolutely right. So quietly and peacefully they divorced completely without emotion and parted like ships at sea, wishing each other happiness in their personal lives. Maria even breathed a sigh of relief when she went back to live alone. Better this way than with a boar. This time the woman had a stern talk with her mother. Mammy, no more acquaintances and suitors is enough for me. I cannot build family happiness without love. I've got it all figured out. I guess it's my destiny to spend my life alone. One day she was on her way home from work early in the morning and heard a faint squeak near a garbage can. She couldn't help but wonder what was going on. Something moved in the bag. She overcame squeamishness and took it out of the trash and untied it. There was a little puny kitten in there. Maria's heart ached with pity for the baby, and she didn't hesitate. She carried the poor thing home. So she got a cat. Maria treated its eyes and fleas for a long time. The cat grew up to be a real Zionist beauty. He was very devoted to his mistress and asked for her loneliness. While Maria was lying there thinking about everything, her favorite pet just under the forest, curled up by the side and began to murmur, soothing his mistress. Finally, the woman fell asleep. The next day, Maria decided that she could not live as before until she knew the whole truth. Then a boy who looked so much like Frank awakened feelings and feelings she had recently forgotten, hidden in a distant corner of her soul. His face was before her eyes a whole time. She found in the press note about the last wedding, found out that the groom's name was James, and then it was just a matter of technique. She went to an acquaintance at the passport office and found out everything about the man. Turns out he wasn't a millionaire. Growing up, of course, he was well off. His parents, businessmen of medium means, had their own small confectionery factory, where he also worked as a manager. She made up her mind, took her pictures of her and Frank together, and went to their production facility under the guise of a customer. She had no trouble finding James's office and went in to see him. Good afternoon. My name is Maria. Do you remember I confused you with a man at a wedding? It was an ugly scandal at the time. 
Don't think I'm crazy. Listen to me. Look at these pictures. And she handed him the pictures. The man looked at them intently, and his face changed its expression. He, too, was perplexed. It really was a mess. The guy really looked just like me. Just like two peas in a pod. But how is that possible? What about you? The groom in this picture? Who is he? Where is he now? What kind of family did he grow up in? I thought you were crazy at the wedding. But now I understand your emotions. You loved him very much. Maria sighed and began the story. He is the first and only love of my life. His name is Frank. His mother is his midwife. She knew my parents. It was at our house visiting, and I met him for the first time. Frank was passionate, generous, sincere, but also very hot-tempered and terribly jealous. We got into a fight over the tiniest of things. He was jealous of me at the reunion with a classmate. We had a stupid breakup. Then he and my mother went somewhere, to the next town, I think. I never met him again. I think it's been a long time and I'm married. I was married and divorced, and he was the only one in my heart. When I saw you at the wedding, I felt like I was going crazy. Everything in my soul was stirred up. It's just, you know well, there's no such thing as people who look alike. There's a mystery here. I've been up all night. I can't think of anything. So I thought I'd talk to you in person. I thought maybe you knew something, but you're afraid to tell me. After all, everyone knows that your father-in-law has a very bad temper. James thought about it. You're probably right. I'll tell you what. I'll talk to my parents. Maybe they know something. You say your fiancé Frank lived with his mother. But I certainly have a father and a mother. And they never had anything to do with medicine. Leave me your number. I'll call you back. That's a good point about your father-in-law. I hope Jenna didn't inherit his personality. They said a warm and friendly goodbye. And Maria ran straight to her shift. And she was so afraid she was going to be late. And James decided to stop by his parents' house that day for a serious talk. His mother was fussing in the kitchen, and his father was flicking through the channels and looking at the news on the TV. When they saw their son, they were very happy and rushed to hug him. My father happily told me that it was you, my son, who decided to visit the old people in the middle of the week. Or had something happened? James decided not to be sly and ask straight out, Mama, you remember at my wedding, the medicine woman mistook me for someone else. Then there was a scandal. Well, look at these photos. That's that woman's fiancé. But he looks exactly like me. How do you explain that? Wendy, with her eyes downcast, sighed a little silent, and then began, Son, well, what can I tell you? So many years have passed, and already I thought I would take this secret to my grave. You have somewhere in the world a twin brother. I gave birth to you two one minute apart. Both boys. No sooner had I got out of labor than there was a fire in the maternity hospital. Such a panic started. We were evacuated or transferred to another hospital. In the end, one of the twins was missing. They just brought me you. How many times did my father and I fought and wrote a complaint to the police and they had a checkup. The chief doctor was fired. The baby was never found. I have long grieved and could not realize how come, where is my daughter? I thought maybe the doctors were killed in the fire. The case was hushed up. In general, it was a dark story. Everything cleared up over time. Life continued, and we did not dare to tell you about my brother. What's the point of hurting your soul? Well, that's how it happened. James was dumbfounded by what he heard. He was indignant. But how could it be? Why didn't you go on looking for the child? Maybe he was wandering. Maybe he needed help. No, I'm not going to leave it like that. I'm gonna see this through and find out where my brother is. The internet, social media, private investigators. I mean, I'm sure I can find him. When James left his parents' house, he immediately called Maria, making an appointment at a cafe nearby. A sea of emotions raged inside him, and Maria was the only one who could understand him now. 
James caught himself thinking that he really liked this pretty, smiling woman with curly glasses. Her fullness didn't spoil her at all. On the contrary, her succulent form gave her a piquancy. He subconsciously compared her to his wife, Jenna, a long platinum blonde. She had all her outward appearance, but she didn't look real. She didn't look like a doll. And how could he have liked it just recently? And now he was waiting for Maria and saw her from a distance, but a little out of breath. He could see that she was in a hurry, reaching out and waving to him from afar. So warmly, sincerely smiled the man, right behind admired, but immediately pulled himself back. What are you thinking, James? That we're going on a honeymoon. I mean, it's a honeymoon. And you're drooling over another man's woman. Maria asked excitedly. Good afternoon, James. How did you find out? James told her all the news about his brother, about the fire, and his emotions. Can you imagine, Maria? How could they, my parents? Why didn't they tell me anything before? Couldn't they have done something? Tried to find my brother. I could have communicated with him. How could I find him? Now I'm very interested in that. I have some ideas. Maria also shared the news. You know, I asked my mom too, and she asked her colleagues at the hospital. And they seem to have found out where Frank and his mother went. It's the neighboring town. That's all I've learned from my work. I don't have time to play detective. I'm on call 24-7. What to do? I don't know. And then it hit James. Look, you're right. You could hire a private investigator. I've got enough money for that. Gather all the information, photos, and we'll go to the same agency. Anyway, a professional will find the case faster. We have one goal now. You need to find a fiancé, and I need to find my own brother. That's what they did. James hired an excellent professional who had been searching for missing people for over 20 years and knew the ins and outs of his job. A couple of weeks later, Detective Peter called them and made an appointment at the agency. James stopped by Maria's house and they drove off. The woman noticed that the man was upset about something. He was moody and uncommunicative. She asked, is something wrong? You look very sad. You don't look like you're enjoying your honeymoon at all. Yeah, I guess I jumped the gun on getting married. My parents insisted when they found out Jenna had a snot-free daughter, figured it would be good for the general business of a profitable alliance. While we were dating, everything was fun and interesting. Hangouts, clubs, vacations abroad. And after they got married, it turned out that this was the lifestyle Jenna had all the time and she doesn't know how to do anything around the house at all and doesn't want to learn. But that's not the main thing either. I am able to hire a cook. It's not a problem. But we've already had a big fight. Turns out Jenna is being protective. Doesn't want to have kids at all. You know, that's wild to me, to be honest. I was sure that every woman dreams of having a family and children. I hope she said that in the heat of the moment, without thinking. Otherwise, Maria shook her head. Yes, it's not fun, but it's okay. You're just picking on each other. It's always difficult at first. Though frankly, I'm not much of a counselor. Didn't save my first love myself. Could not get along with her husband. So I live with a cat. Didn't work out with kids either. God didn't give it to me. So now the cat's my ally. He won't hurt me. Finally, they arrived. The detective laid out some photographs and papers on the table and began to report the situation. What can I tell you, gentlemen? This case is complicated and complicated, especially concerning your and your brother's birth. It is a very dark case, and they tried to hush it up and forget it. I could hardly find the ends. Such an emergency did happen. A newborn baby disappeared from the maternity hospital without a trace in a fire. But I found out that your fiancé's mother, Nina, was working there at the time. I also managed to track down a good old acquaintance of hers, a neighbor in her old apartment. She told me that Nina was childless. Her husband had divorced her when she was young. And right after the fire she took a sick leave. And then she suddenly paid off her debts, and the most important thing, she sold her good apartment in the center 
and moved out of nowhere to the outskirts of apartment. Don't you think it's strange? A couple of years later the women met by chance at a mall sale. Well, Nina was leading the baby by the hand and pretended not to recognize her close friend. She was hurt and surprised. After all, they had been friends for so many years and never fought. It seems that why such a reaction? About the child was also strange. Where did she get it? But the woman soon forgot about it. Why does she need someone else's problems? My opinion, Nina won the baby on the sly in the fire. There was no one else. Maria wondered why you didn't ask her yourself, or didn't you find her? You need to get it straight from the horse's mouth. All we have so far is speculation and conjecture. Peter grinned. Why did you find her? In the cemetery. The woman died a long time ago. Five years ago, I looked up her history, her illness, and it was all banal, a stroke. So the true motives for her action, we will not know, alas, anymore. Maria couldn't take it. So what about Frank? Where does he live? Was he married or not? Her heart began to beat fast. It threw her up. The detective became very serious and thoughtful. What I'm about to tell you will be very hard news for you. A year ago, Frank died. He was an avid motorcyclist. He even went to work as a stuntman, married a simple girl. She also shared his interests, and they liked to drive on the night track with the wind, according to acquaintances. He was killed in a motorcycle accident together with his wife. He failed to control at high speed and crashed into a pole. He and his wife are buried in the cemetery. But he left behind a daughter, Mila, who is three years old. She is now in an orphanage as the family has no relatives left. Frank's wife was also an orphan. I wrote you the address of the orphanage if you need it. Such a sad story. Maria. She couldn't hear anything else and cried her eyes out. Only the hope began to dawn on her that she would see her son, at least in one glance. And then such bitter news was so bad and smooth on the soul. James sat silent as a pierced man and did not know at all how to react to all this. Just thought he had gained a brother and immediately lost him. And Maria was very sorry for him, except he didn't know what words to use. The woman wiped away her tears and said quietly, Anyway, thank you for everything. Better the bitter truth than ignorance and false hopes. The day after tomorrow I have a day off. I will be sure to visit Frank's daughter at the orphanage. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go. I just want to be alone. Maria came home, not knowing the way. All by the racks and eyes were spinning in her head only one thought. There is no more Frank. How could it be? If it hadn't been for their stupid pride, things might have turned out differently. But why wasn't I happy? I have a job. I have an apartment. And my parents are alive and well. But my personal life just isn't working out. I wish I had a child, a little happiness, an outlet. But there isn't and won't be. In all these years, I never got pregnant. Maria worked for 24 hours. It was finally her day off. She bought a nice big doll at the toy store, lots of sweets, and went to the orphanage. The woman explained long and confusingly to the manager who she was and why she wanted to see the girl. At first she resisted. It is not allowed, that's all. The girl's parcel will be given to her. It is always welcome, and there is no need for unnecessary visits, only to upset the girl. Myla is already mentally unstable. Apparently, the consequences of stress on the background of the death of her parents. Maria couldn't take it. How can you not understand? This is the daughter of my beloved man who died. I want to meet the baby, get to know her better, and adopt her. I will never have children of my own, but I have an apartment and a steady job. So why can't I give happiness to this poor girl? You're a woman. Don't you understand how important it is for me to feel like a mother? Otherwise, what's the point of living at all? I've been thinking about clarification for a long time. And here's the situation. After all, the girl is not a stranger to me. It's a piece of a loved one. Old Molly's heart trembled, and she told me to move the girl to the playroom. Maria sat there like on pins and needles, 
worried what to say, how to behave, whether the little girl would accept her. After all, she had never even seen her. No one knows how the child will react to a stranger. Suddenly, she heard behind her, Mommy, you came for me. The stunned woman turned to her, a skinny little girl pulling her arms. She looked so much like Frank. The same button nose and blonde hair, round hair, surprised eyes, dimples on her cheeks. Everything inside her turned over. Tears dripped from her eyes. She instinctively lifted the child in her arms, and the baby trustingly embraced her. Maria clearly heard the pounding of her little heart, the warmth, her body, and realized she would never be able to part with her again. The woman whispered softly, My name is Maria. I would very much like to be your mother, to love you. We would play and draw with you. And also we would go to the circus, to the merry-go-round. Mila was batting her eyes, begging don't go, take me away from here. I'm not bad, she scolds me all the time. I don't want to be here. Maria handed her presents. Take this, it's Tanya's doll. She'll stay with you until I pick you up and keep you safe. There are a lot of goodies in here. Take it and eat it. The little girl pushed the doll away from her and clung to the woman again. I don't want a doll. Don't leave me, please. And she looked at her with tear-filled eyes. Everything inside Maria was overturned. An avalanche of love and pity for the girl swept over her. Already from that second, she considered her to be her own. The woman pleaded with the supervisor, but let me take Mila home. My papers are in order. But you understand that the paperwork for the adoption procedure, a lot of inspections can take months, and the girl will continue to suffer here. You can see she's not happy here, it's obvious. But don't you have a heart? Molly stood her ground. I understand, and you are right in many ways. Millie can't settle down here, even though so much time has passed. She is very homely, and doesn't like to talk to people. I'm surprised she came up to you right away and called you her mother. I think she will have a tantrum as usual. A couple came in the other day, too, childless, wanted to meet her. So nice run away, crying and hiding under the table. Apparently, you look a lot like her mother. But by law, I can't give her to you yet. I'm sorry. That's when Maria made up her mind, called James, explained the situation briefly. She begged him to do something to help. She wasn't a stranger's niece. She was no stranger to him after all. He answered at once and told her to wait. She mustn't go anywhere on the spot. Fifteen minutes later, the phone rang in the manager's office. She was talking to someone for a long time, making excuses, explaining something and giving Maria a meaningful look. Then she answered. But I didn't know. All right, I will check it out. Yes, I understand I will, but only as an exception. Then she turned to Maria. Apparently you have very good connections in the ministry. They called me from there and asked me to help you. Why didn't you tell them at once that she was a relative of son-in-law? We didn't know about it. Yours is taken. Take the baby. But all the documents and procedures for adoption will go through the general procedure. Maria picked me up in her arms and happily said, Well, my daughter, let's go home. You're never coming back here again. The girl hugged her even tighter around the neck and said, I've been waiting for you. I knew you would find me and no one believed me. From that day on Maria's life began to change. She took time off from work and became immersed in taking care of her daughter. They got along so well from the first second that it seemed like they were not adopted, but really kindred blood. At first Myla was frightened from loud noises and often cried in her sleep. Apparently, she had suffered a lot in the orphanage, or it was the stress of the experience. But in time that went away, Maria officially adopted Mela a month later. She took her to kindergarten and met her grandparents. The parents, of course, were shocked by their daughter's brave act, but they supported her. This is beyond her years. The mature, serious babe couldn't help but melt their hearts. Lovely, really, was an obedient, wonderful girl. And Maria just changed beyond recognition. She blossomed, rejuvenated. Her eyes lit up. What was her hurry now? 
Taking care of a child did not weigh her down. It only pleased her. After all, she was now a mommy like all normal women. So mom and dad Maria was now also happy to start with her granddaughter and sit with her as needed. This was a great help to the woman, especially when she was on the clock at work. James started dropping by their house more and more often. At first to sort of chat with his niece, he brought her sweets and gifts and bought her expensive cute socks, but Mila stubbornly refused to call him uncle. She called him daddy. After all, he looked just like him. James was both pleased and frightened at the same time. After all, it wasn't entirely true. The man greatly respected Maria for such a noble act, for she was raising his own niece on her own initiative. It was always fun and interesting at their house, and it smelled like cinnamon and fresh baked goods. The woman patiently taught letters with cubes and counting rules, twiddling her thumbs with her, and she read a lot with her. The girl loved to listen to stories. Somewhere, the excessive fullness disappeared imperceptibly as she skewed, and now there was no time to eat stress and sweets. The whole day is scheduled. The woman and James decided to visit Frank's grave at the cemetery. The man bought two carnations and they set off. It took a long time to mix it up. Finally, they found the grave next to Frank was his wife's grave looked at the photo, and it was immediately clear why Mila mistook her for her mother. They were very similar, curly brown hair and a similar smile. Even James was surprised. Look how much Frank's late wife resembled your type. I guess he couldn't get over you either and subconsciously found a girl who looked like you. So it often happens, you love once and then you are always looking for someone similar. Maria stood by her fiance's grave for a long time. Well, hello Frank, here we are, you and I have met. I'm sorry things never worked out between us. I loved you very much, I still do. Even though I know you're gone. Don't worry, I've got your little girl. I took her away from the orphanage. I'll love her and raise her as my own. She is a wonderful girl, my outlet. A light at the end. Now I'm not alone. Thank you, my good ones, for those beautiful moments of my youth. They have warmed me all my life. James also said quietly well, Hello brother, so much for seeing you. Sorry we didn't communicate and didn't know each other when we were alive. Not my fault. I didn't know anything about you. Our parents, without asking permission, decided our fates. But we could have been friends with you and talked to you. Now I will visit you, take care of your grave. After a little more silence near the graves, both of them felt a little better. And in the James family, the situation kept escalating. And Jenna turned out to be a lazy, inert girl. She didn't know how to do anything and didn't want to learn anything. Accustomed since childhood to be capricious and get on a platter everything she wanted. She tried to act the same way with her husband, considering him almost a servant. All she could hear was, James, get me some water, but not the kind with gas, and my back. When he came home from work, the man hoped for at least some dinner, but no. The kitchen table was always empty. When he started cursing, Jenna's response was sincere indignation. You say don't be a drag. Let's order a pizza or go to a restaurant. You know I can't cook. You're making a scene on purpose, aren't you? So maybe you should get off the couch and start learning and roll in cooking classes after all. In any case, do not do anything all day. The young wife would just start immediately calling her father and complaining all over James' unbearable field. He hurt your princess again. Well, will you at least tell him I'm not cooking? Tell him what? You could hire a cook, couldn't you? At least you understand me. Her father had given her an excellent education, trained her to be a designer at a prestigious institute, but she wasn't even going to get a job. Jenna led an idle lifestyle. She slept until lunchtime, then visited beauty salons and fashion stores with her girlfriends. In the evening, she would be able to condescend to talk to her husband. She didn't put James at all into anything and considered him just a nice bonus to her luxurious life. She was used to having everything solved by a single call from her overbearing father and was as capricious as a child on any occasion overbearing. 
The autocratic father was obsessed with his daughter, and daddy poked at all her even the most ridiculous desires. At the same time, she was not the least bit embarrassed about spending nights at the nightclub with her girlfriends. And not only that, often she was brought in in an insane state. James was nervous. They argued endlessly in such unbearable nervousness. Three months went by, and the man's patience snapped. He plucked up the courage and decided to get a divorce. Jenna, look, you have to admit, our marriage was a mistake. You're completely unfit for married life. You don't want to have kids, and I'm sick of your partying and your bossy tone. Let's get a divorce before it's too late. Find yourself another errand boy. I never was, and never will be. Jenna pouted an already skewed silicone lips, and out of habit immediately began to dial her father's number. Daddy. Disaster. James is leaving me. That bastard. We're getting a divorce. He doesn't like pacifiers. He says I'm lazy. I don't want to have children with him. Get over here quick and deal with him. James felt sick to his stomach. He vividly imagined what was about to happen. Anger. He was feared by everyone from the housemates to the employees. The enraged billionaire rushed immediately, bulging his eyes, not understanding, began to shout like a madman. What are you doing? You lost your fear. My daughter is not allowed to hurt anyone. What divorce? We just got married. Why do you have to be such a jerk? Do you have any idea who you're going after? You ain't never gonna get as pretty as my girl. James was nervous and sweaty, but he was determined to go all the way. It was now or never. I am tired of putting up with your daughter's affairs and the whims of your daughter, and I can live without your one million, and I have my favorite job. No such family is my dream. Jenna is not going to grow up and work and have children. So what's the point of us living together then? We're getting a divorce, period. I'm not an errand boy or an empty seat like everyone else thinks. I won't have my feet rubbed and my wishes disregarded. Father only shook his fist in James' face. He wanted to strangle his stubborn son-in-law. Though deep down he knew that he was right and he, as a father, had made a mistake in her upbringing. That's the kind of whimsy that's absolute to all whims. But he wasn't going to admit it out loud. And so he shouted menacingly, ah, so well, get out of here. Mind you, I didn't draw up the prenuptial agreement for nothing. I knew you wouldn't get a cent. We'll find a replacement for you in no time. No one's going to hurt my daughter. James exhaled. The worst was over the oligarch agreed to their divorce and quietly began to gather his things in a suitcase. Jenna didn't shed a tear and continued clicking away on her phone. So she was leaving. It's all right. Daddy will find a new groom. Maria was just feeding Nella dinner and telling her a story when the doorbell rang. Strange. Who could it be at this hour? I don't seem to be expecting anyone. She opened the door and was speechless. Standing on the doorstep was James, with a suitcase on wheels. He lowered his eyes and asked quietly if he could come in. I'm getting a divorce from Jenna. Maria let the man in. It didn't go to my heart. I understand he is bitter enough right now. Just sat him down at the table. The hostess warmed up some hot potatoes and meat, sliced a simple salad, took out of the fridge a bottle of cherry wine bought on occasion. Olives poured a small glass and said let's drink so that all the bad things in our lives would go away. And there were only good things ahead. James looked at her gratefully, drank the good stuff, and ate with gusto. Then together, they scooped up the little princess. She was laughingly knocking over baby foam in the bathtub with a yellow tinge. Then they read her a story and went to bed. James felt so good and comfortable. Maria had the feeling that both she and Mila had been in his life for a long time. It was the kind of woman sweet, loving children, creating comfort in the home that he had always dreamed of. Maria came out of the shower so fresh and ruddy and embarrassedly asked James, where do you want your bed? Her heart jumped out of her chest. After all, a lot depended on his answers. She still didn't fully understand how he felt about her. 
Whether he loved her or simply pitied her, she was sure of herself. She couldn't help but love Frank brother. So deep were those feelings inside her. James suddenly took her hand in his and said quietly, Maria, I don't know how it happened, but I fell in love with you long ago. And now I love Myla too. Just the kind of wife I have always dreamed of. You are the best, believe me, I have something to compare it to. It must be such fate that my brother and I, whom I have never seen, have fallen in love with the same woman. Marry me. I feel so good around you. Maria reached out to him and kissed him timidly. That was her answer. Yes. Unable to hold back, James picked her up in his arms and carried her into the bedroom. Maria had not felt such a thrill and such a beautiful sensation since that night in the wilderness with Frank. And now with James, it was happening all over again. It was just wonderful. Unlike the impatient and abrupt Frank, James loved her unhurriedly, skillfully, and knowingly. They locked eyes until dawn, completely disconnected from reality. Only when they heard a voice from the nursery did the sweetheart awake. Both jumped up like scalded and began to dress with laughter. The girl was very happy to see James at breakfast and happily asked Ye, Daddy, you will live with us all the time now. You won't go anywhere. The man could barely hold back the tears that were running and answered, No, my little bead. I'm not going anywhere. And come on, hurry up and eat your porridge and Daddy will take you to kindergarten. Mommy's going to be late for work. Maria watched as James proudly leads Mela by the hand, wrapped sandwiches for him to work, kissed him goodbye, thought to herself. At last I had a real close-knit, close-knit family. What a blessing it is, it turns out, to care, to love someone, and to know that it's mutual. A year went by, and everything went back to normal. Mila adored her parents. Maria and James lived very close together. Lately, James began to worry about his spouse. She was very nervous, worked up, often irritated and cried over nothing. More in secret, of course, so he wouldn't see. And also very much began to get better, and she ate herself without noticing it almost every half hour. The man thought that all to blame overwork, and she thus ate stress. But just to be on the safe side, he decided to talk her into seeing a doctor. Maria, I think you need to see a doctor. There's something going on with you, I can tell. Maybe he could prescribe some pills to calm you down. Or take a vacation. The three of us can go somewhere. The woman got offended and the traffic cop got all excited. I myself am a doctor with many years of practice. Why do I have to go somewhere? I'd rather know what's going on with me. Or are you unhappy that I gained weight again? So I'm prone to obesity. My metabolism is all wrong, and you know that. Why do you have to go over my head again? And suddenly she was crying again. For some reason, she was so hurt, and it seemed that James was provoking her on purpose. But when she finished her sandwich between calls, Cindy couldn't stand it. Maria, should you go to the gynecologist or at least get a test? I'm not an expert, of course, but I look at you for a month, and I see myself five years ago, I also ate everything and cried all the time. I think you're pregnant. The woman was taken aback and even choked on her tea. Cindy, don't be ridiculous. I'm infertile. It's just not possible. Although, yes, it can't be. Oh, I'm gonna run to the drugstore for a second. Five minutes and we're off. Tonight, Maria locked herself in the bathroom. Didn't come out for a long time. James got worried told Mila to paint while she went to see what was wrong. He knocked. Sweetheart, is everything all right in there? Have you been long? No, Mila and I are worried. I'll open the door. Maria opened the door and silently held out the test to her husband. It was a bright two stripes. She kept saying, I don't believe it. It just can't be. Maybe it's some kind of hormonal malfunction. Sometimes you get a false positive test. Besides, I've had problems with it since I was young. James grabbed her and started spinning her around. Jesus, Maria, is it really true? We're going to the doctor tomorrow. I want to hear it myself. 
The very next day they were at the gynecologist. The doctor examined Maria and took her to an ultrasound. Her husband did not lag behind, afraid to listen to the most important thing. The elderly doctor, looking at the screen, Oh, my dear, what took you so long at 16 weeks? It's high time to register. You're a physician, and so cold to his health. It's a normal pregnancy. It's a boy. Congratulations, get registered, and we'll keep an eye on you. Maria sobbed on the couch, crying her eyes out. She couldn't help herself. She was shaking like a fever. The dumbfounded gynecologist asked what was wrong with you. You are not happy with this news. Why are you crying? The baby's fine. I don't see any abnormalities. You need to calm down. It's true. Your hormones are acting up. I'm going to write you a prescription to calm your nerves. The woman was explaining in a frantic voice. No, I'm happy. I just can't believe it. I had no idea I was pregnant. I thought it was a hormonal malfunction. I get like that sometimes. I've been dealing with it my whole life. Hence the extra weight. I thought I was infertile for years and I didn't hope for a miracle. Thank you, doctor. He just smiled. Why don't you tell your husband for me? Thank you. He's the one who did it. How often a miracle happens when you don't expect it. James almost jumped for joy. He wanted to sing and dance, but everything was jubilant. Yay, he was about to become a father. Here was his cherished dream coming true. All the more reason for the boy to be an heir. It's something he'd never dreamed of. He hugged his wife and cheerfully announced that from that day on he would be sparing everyone to do light work. I don't know what. Let's not risk the baby. I will not survive if something happens. What do you want? How about some pickles? Or some sauerkraut? Maria laughed. I feel fine. Don't worry, honey. It's just that I really want to eat all the time. The doctor advised me to buy some fruit and raisins and nuts and eat them. That you don't gain much. But James waved his hands. No, no, eat whatever you want. I'll love you anything. By the way, being full doesn't spoil you at all, honestly. Don't get yourself worked up about it. You just don't get an appetite. In the evening, they carefully began to prepare Myla. We've got good news. You're about to have a brother. Are you excited? The little girl thought about it and got serious. I don't know. He's going to take my toys. Don't you love me? What will he be like my doll? The boys in kindergarten are so mean. Can't we exchange him for a little sister before it's too late? Maybe we could get a girl. Where is he now in your tummy? I know everything. Maria laughed and began to explain. No, honey, unfortunately, you can't change it. Do not worry, we will not love you less. You're our favorite daughter. You and I both will play daughters of the mother, bathe, feed the baby. And then, when he grows up, we will be friends with you. Mela sighed and answered well. All right then. Let it be a boy, if you can't change it. It's a deal. Maria went with Mila to her parents' house and told them the news that she was pregnant. The mother cried and congratulated and hugged her daughter. Everyone was excited and happy that she was finally starting a bright period in her life. They loved Mila very much and were happy that her granddaughter was coming soon. Pregnancy went easily and without complications. Maria ran to work until the last minute. After all, no matter how you look at it, saving patients' lives was her true calling. James just adored his round, funny show wife. She became so touchy, funny, but covered in big red-headed cannons, went from side to side, and ate all the time in her due time. As much as four pounds, her son was named David at Mila's request. That was the name of her fiancé from daycare. When the baby came home, she long and meticulously examined David. Kindrily touched him by the little stewed hand. Then she said, I like my brother all right. He looks like the P.U.P.P.s from kindergarten. What will we do when he cries? Maria laughed, and we'll give him a pacifier and sing songs and rock in the cradle. Honey was frightened. Oh, and I do not know a single lullaby. I'm going to learn it. 
James was absolutely proud and happy started home from work as a sunburned man. He enjoyed walking with his son and wash him, and couldn't be happier. One day the millionaire, standing in traffic at an intersection, saw all the happy families assembled. He recognized his former son-in-law. James was proudly rolling his stroller, and an unsightly smart woman was walking beside him. The hand of the girl was molding. Everyone was laughing, talking about something, eating ice cream. The man of the line rushed and looked enviously after them, thinking to himself, Eh, such a son-in-law lost. Stupid Jenna. The years go by. And what did he end up with? He had a real family, kids. What about me? My daughter, who is slipping lower and lower and has struggled with white powder many times and no grandchildren to speak of. Near her regularly ripped some gigolo who sang dithyrams for money. But a normal relationship was out of the question. I will die that way, and I won't get any grandchildren. I shouldn't have spoiled Jenna. Oh, for nothing. Still, what did James see in that fat doctor? I don't know what she saw in him. I mean, Jenna was so much prettier. And he didn't know that real happiness wasn't in millions or long legs. And it's not about a pretty face. It's much more important what kind of person is inside. After all, a kind soul, responsive to other people's troubles. The heart will always find its way to happiness, finding it in the simplest ordinary things.